when it happens. I like the wave, the body, and and your bangs. It's really, it's a new look, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's that uh, thick Mexican hair. So, <laughs> Chia Cecil, <laughs> not quite like Chia Jean. We are live, and we are back, ladies and gentlemen. After a week off, it is the Audible Live here, the FootballGuys.com podcast, our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash dotcom Bloom, we've got over a thousand sub, uh, subscribers on our on our uh, YouTube channel. I love it. Yes, and y'all are so kind. As I often say, don't encourage us. And you are, here you go, encouraging us. Uh, this is what, our second year doing the Hangouts? Right. And um, it's it's been great. And I look forward to the Sunday morning Hangouts, and I look forward to future iterations of Draft Hangouts. And I know that it, it's made me feel like I get to renew acquaintances with you and Gene and Matt and some of our other special guests. And I hope it feels that way for the audience, too. Yeah, well, we were really spoiled, you know, back in 08, 09, when we saw each other every week doing the five-minute drill when I'd fly down to Austin. So it's kind of nice to get that reconnection. You know, it comes through, obviously, in the chemistry with all of us. And, oh. and we don't get to see each other enough, you know? By the way, Cease, by mm-hmm. the way, um, and to everybody else out there, and, you know, I've been cleaning out the basement, our flooded out basement. The, the, the tropical storm bill came through and we did not take on more water at least not as of this moment so big shout out to rick rosenberg our our contractor who built a wall in the ground this is the bloom uh flooded basement update uh brought to you by uh water seal uh what was the name of that stuff they used to in the nba nfl games there'd always be commercials for the stuff the seal that you would put on your deck i can't remember it anyway we're getting into alcoa fantastic finishes um so I've got to say, I've got to just pass on a really funny story, Cease. Um, FEMA. I I called FEMA on Monday. They had somebody at my house on Tuesday. And by today, they had already settled our our claim, or not really a claim, you know, our 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 damage and and, and given us an amount of reimbursement for our trouble. So hey, your tax dollars at work. <laughs> a FEMA update on the show, ladies and gentlemen. So it's good to th- hear that everything turned out. We know that, um, you know, there's there's a, a bunch of issues, a bunch of tragedy in this world. And, and I will say this, Bloom, uh, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone uh, involved uh, in just the horrific uh, event that we had uh, yesterday in Charleston, um, you know, just we, we pray for those and the families that were affected and we're really thinking about you guys. Um, I always say this and getting emails from listeners where it's like, and boom, we get the tweets, right? We were off last week. People are like, what, what are you doing? Where are you, where are you at? Where are you at? I got an hour and a half commute. Where are you guys at? Like, where's the show? And we love that. Thank you guys. Um, and I will say this, Bloom, I know you wholeheartedly agree with me. It's a privilege to be a part of your life. Right. It is. Each and every one of you out there watching, listening to the show, it is a privilege that you let us in. And, you know, we are part of that distraction or part of the entertainment. I mean, there's a lot of heavy, heavy stuff going on right now. And, and again, the best thing to do is just come together and, you know, be kind to one another and, and, and put out those positive vibes. So we're happy to be here to talk about this silly little thing called fantasy football that we've been talking about now entering our 10th season of the audible. So we thank everyone out there for listening. Bloom, I know you uh, definitely agree with that. Yes. And I, as I say at the end of the couch, you know, it's almost a, a sacred or holy thing that like right now you're letting us in and uh, we, we let you in too. And I love hearing from people. I love it when people reach out uh, and, you know, getting out on the road too. Um, and I've had more and more opportunities when I'm out at concerts or if I'm out at a baseball game to meet up with people and I put Tommy Wright, old Tommy guns from old Yeller. Uh, well, last one I was in San, San Diego. I might be taking in a pirate game in Pittsburgh, believe it or not, next weekend. Um, so it, it's our community is amazing, and fantasy football victories and other things that we've done in the fantasy football industry or football industry in general pale in comparison to the community that we've created and that we will have for the rest of our lives. And uh, see, I know you've probably had similar visions. I, I just picture one day. Uh, us being able to to get in an RV and just go around the country and park in the driveway of different listeners and hang out uh, during the summer because it's really the community that makes this show. Uh, it's not us. It's all of us. Right. All of us together talking about football, interacting, dialogue, not a monologue. Let's jump in. By the way, Dr. Gene Brammel has now joined yeah. this video call. So he is here. The He's doctor. always on call. 
and Dr. Gene on call with us right now. What's up, baby? Not much. It's been a couple of weeks. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Yourself out there. Uh, and are, are you ready? Are you feeling it here? We're into mini camps. I mean, we're like a, you know, a month or so away from the start of training camp. Lots of us have a little vacation coming up. The little that we get, um, Dr. Gene, I know you're always on the clock. Are, are you feeling it, man? The season, you can taste it. Yeah, I think we're getting there. You know, we've we've transitioned from, you know, whatever you might call the off season, whether it's free agency or draft and what have you. And this month I think is going to be pretty quiet as we end the OTA and mini camp season and get ready for training camps. But I think this is the time where we really start to get excited. We've got a sense, started to get a sense with these OTAs and mini camps, how things are going to happen, what players might be injured, what the depth charts might start to look like, what teams are thinking about their players for the first time. And, and that always gets our football juice is flowing for sure. There's not going to be a whole lot of news that comes out in the next two or three weeks, but gives us some time to digest what's going on over the past month and get ready for camp. He is Dr. Gene Brammel. It is the Audible Live here at the footballguys.com podcast, our YouTube channel. Thanks, everyone out there for watching. And Dr. Gene, let's go ahead and jump into these injury situations from around the National Football League. Of course, you can follow Dr. Gene on Twitter at Gene Brammel. That's at Gene Brammel, and check out his work at footballguys.com. I have to start in Denver, Dr. Gene, because it is a Broncos show, and because Danny Trevathan has someone else's kneecap. No, he doesn't. Uh -huh. um, let's, let's, let's cut to the chase here, because he's like, this isn't even my knee. And, and, you know, a panic, a flood of texts and tweets in from Broncos fans being like, is Danny Trevathan going to be ready to go? Like, let's talk about his procedure, let's talk about what happened, and let's talk about him not having someone else's kneecap. Yeah, he is not the six million million dollar man. It's not Danny, Steve Austin, Trevathan going on, but it is. It's not the same knee that he had this time last year. It sounds like you know he had a little bit of procedure on that knee. He, had, he probably had the kneecap smoothed out a little bit. He had a bone graft as well. And we've heard about bone grafts. The most common thing we've heard about bone grafts for recently has been the Jones fracture, that fifth metatarsal fracture in the foot, where when these screws get replaced or put in for the first time, oftentimes we see a bone graft put in along the same time. And it just aids in healing. So I don't think it's anything to be too concerned about. It's not, you know, his kneecap wasn't taken out and replaced with somebody else's. Um, not a big change, but hopefully for him, it helps solve some of the issues that he had, at least some of the sequelae of things that he had when he had those uh, fractures around his, it wasn't the kneecap itself, but, um, you know, around the knee in the last, uh, twice last year. So definitely not a new kneecap, though. It was pretty funny to hear him say that, and I think a lot of people's heads turned on Twitter as, you know, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, it just means that it's new to him. It's not an entirely new kneecap. He doesn't have a, a metal prosthesis or anything, although you never know. You know, a lot of these guys get knee replacements and stuff, but that's that's not what's happened to Trevatha. I think it could be a problem like with airport metal detectors like a spinal tap or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and I don't know if Cecil already mentioned it, and I'm sorry to repeat it. If Actually, not sorry, because it deserves to be repeated that you put out your OTA, OTA injury updates, who should and shouldn't worry. Uh, and I like that you boil it down at the end to, uh, well, how much do you worry now? When should you start to really worry? Because th th these are fluid situations. First, I have to ask you a per total personal, nobody cares about my team question, so everyone else can just tune out, you know, <laughs> change, go ch there's no NBA or NHL to look at. Okay, Chandler Jones, he, he's going to be, is he going to be an elite fantasy defensive end, like, from now into the foreseeable future? Um, yes, I think the answer to that question is yes. The difficulty is, as it is so often in IDP leagues, is what positional classifications yeah. uh, we're going to get into. Um, and, you know, Chicago we, has like six outside linebackers. Yeah, and I, I think that's a fairly straightforward situation. In Bill Belichick's case, uh, and maybe what's going on in Atlanta right now, you just really don't know what that depth chart is going to be. And we, are, we have really moved away in the last five to maybe even eight years from um, you know, passing down sub packages comprising only 30 to 40 percent of right. what teams run. So um, there's arguably no base defense anymore. It's a collection of sub packages because most teams run more than one passing down package. There's really no, you know, there's no base front and then nickel front. There's multiple passing down sub packages, and really your base front is is 
maybe 30 to 40 percent at most of what teams run in any given week. So, you know, positional classifications come off of the base defense, but anymore, that's it. Just makes it yeah. more and more confusing. Yeah, and I think I agree it. with New England likely to be a 4-3 base front based on the moves we saw them make in the offseason. But that's that's really the rub with Jones. If Jones is playing defensive end uh, and he's classified that way, then yes, he's got the youth, he's at the peak of his career. I, I don't see his value changing. Yeah. I'm trying to turn Kelvin Benjamin into an elite defensive end. And I want the Gene Bramwell. I mean, I don't even know if I could. I mean, I can't get J.J. Watts. Who's next? All right, all right. Enough about my team. Enough, enough, enough. Um, <laughs> as you as you say in the article, and it's a tremendous article. Just bang it over there, folks. To footballguys.com. I know you're an insider pro with the OTA injury updates. As you say, we ask you uh, every week uh, about Victor Cruz. Well, I want to turn the Victor Cruz question on its head a little bit. As you've been prepping redraft rankings uh, outlook for different players this year, with the Victor Cruz situation in the back of your mind. Does it make you more intrigued by Shane Vereen, by Ruben Randall, by Larry Donnell? Um, how, how do you handle it, not so much for Cruz and Cruz's stock, but for the other Giants pass catchers? I think a lot of that boils down to whether or not it's Ruben Randall for me. You have to ask the question about Ruben Randall. Um, did that little bit of improvement we saw at the end of last year, is that something that's going to carry over and continue? Is he going to be a mature, a more mature route runner? Is he going to stay consistent? Is he going to earn enough of Eli Manning's trust to be a wide receiver three or maybe even a wide receiver two for fantasy leagues? I think you have to ask and answer that question first because if the answer is I'm really still not that confident about Ruben Randall, then it falls to Shane Vereen out of the backfield, which I think is a good option. And we saw Larry Donnell have Eli Manning's attention as a target producer even before Victor Cruz was hurt last year. Um, the other question I think you have to ask yourself there is what does it mean, what does Will Beatty's injury mean for that offensive line uh, and some of the changes they've gone? And is the, are the Giants going to be able to move the ball on offense? Uh, are they going to be able to have any sort of sustaining run game? And are they going to be able to protect Eli Manning? Because if the answer to that question is no, then that impacts Vereen and Randall and Donnell as well. It is the Audible Live each and every Thursday night right here on YouTube.com slash FootballGuysDOTCOM. Make sure if you're listening to this show on iTunes, make sure you watch us on Thursday night or watch the replay and go give us the thumbs up, and we appreciate everyone out there for uh, listening. Kind of ironic and interesting that both Eli and Peyton are going to have rookie left tackles. Eric Flowers? I trust Tyson Brylo a lot more than I do Eric Flowers at left tackle. At least Will Beatty's going to come back in, like, November or something. Uh, let's stick with the Giants, though. I want to bring up Odell Beckham Jr. and the hamstring injury. Dr. Gene Bramble, of course, footballguys.com. In OTA injury updates, who should and shouldn't you worry about? Go ahead and grab it at footballguys.com. Get that Football Guys Insider Pro subscription. And with Odell Beckham Jr. and the hamstring strain, the reason I bring it up, one is because phenomenal talent. Everybody loves him. Everybody's taking him. Everybody wants him. If you don't got him, you want Odell Beckham Jr. on your team. But the hamstring injury last year that knocked him out of the first month of the season. You know, this has got a history. And this reminds me of an Isaac Bruce situation. And maybe some of our younger listeners or viewers may be like, what? Isaac <laughs> Bruce? What? But in 1994... You know, as he came out as a rookie, he didn't really play that much, really didn't do that much uh, in his first season. Second season, 1,781 yards, 13 touchdowns. Se uh, third season, 1,300 yards, 38, uh, 1,338, seven touchdowns. After that, two years of getting banged up again. So Bruce, phenomenal talent, a little bit of a similar skill set. Odell Beckham Jr., uh, higher upside in my opinion, but 1,700 yards, my God. Uh, and what Isaac Bruce was able to do. But those hammies plagued him, Dr. Gene. We've already got Beckham banged up this offseason with more hammies. Seems to be minor. They're being super careful. Good, good, good. But is this something where, okay, maybe he gets a couple big years and then some hammy problems are back, misses four or five games, and he can still put up the numbers, obviously. But how concerned should fantasy owners be with this latest hamstring injury with Odell Beckham Jr.? It needs to be in the back of your mind, but this goes back to the injury-prone question for me, which I think three or four years from now, in hindsight, we'll know the answer to that question, but to definitively say, 
I would be much more concerned about Odell Beckham than I would be uh, Des Bryant, A.J. Green, another player in that particular tier right now. is really difficult to say. This isn't the same hamstring as it was last year. Um, when we fought, you know, in hindsight, I think it was clear that Odell Beckham probably had a mid-grade strain in the summer last year, came back a little bit too soon, aggravated it. We know those aggravations are usually at least as significant, if not more severe, than the original strain and cost him another four to six to eight weeks. And then once he was fully recovered, we saw him, you know, just take the league by storm. Um, one of the things that 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 helps me to decide, or at least pushes me to decide, is it more than you know? We hear about tweaks and soreness, and you know we don't really get a sense because we can't, we didn't see the injury, and we don't hear about MRI results, and we haven't seen what the practice schedule is. So it's very hard to tell what's low grade, what's mid grade, what's high grade this time of year because we don't have enough information. One of the things that tends to worry me a little bit more is if a player has missed one OTA or mini camp week session of practices and doesn't come back for the next session two, three, four, five weeks later, that would worry you a little bit. In Beckham's case, he more than anybody else, we saw Darren McFadden and um, so many other guys, it just they're not coming to mind right now. Lots of guys miss time, you know, Doriel Green Beckham and Kelvin Benjamin and lots of guys miss some time in mini camps and OTAs with hamstring issues and muscle strains and other soreness, but they came back for the next session. Beckham is the one guy of that group that did not. Um, so there's a little bit reason for concern there in my mind. However, we know what happened with Beckham last year. And we know that Beckham has a good grasp of the offense. We know that he has good chemistry with Eli Manning and that he had a setback that cost him a number of weeks at the beginning of the year last year. So there are lots of good reasons and maybe reassuring reasons for the Giants to be cautious with him at this point in the offseason. There's really no reason to risk something that's going to cost him four to eight weeks around training camp just to get him in through what's probably not meaningful in the sense of installation or chemistry with Eli Manning at this point. So I'm willing to give Beckham the benefit of the doubt. If he is not ready to go early in training camp, if he starts on PUP, if they're managing his reps through the first couple of weeks of camp, if we don't see him in those first couple of preseason games, then I think we have to get the microscope out a little bit more and decide whether or not this is something that could plague him for the rest of the season or be something nagging. But, you know, you mentioned Isaac Bruce. We could say the same thing about Andre Johnson. There's lots of wide receivers who have struggled off and on with muscle strain who have gone on to have successful seasons. So let's see how Beckham looks the last week of July, the first couple of weeks of August, and we'll go from there. Talk about a fresh new injury situation, which is actually not a new injury situation with Devontae Parker, Gene. Uh, and it was the same foot that he broke during the season that he came back on. And I think anybody that watched Devontae Parker before 2014 and then watched him after he came back uh, from the broken foot last year would say he wasn't quite himself. Uh, and then you see that he had the screw replaced in his foot. Uh, possibly could be back by week one. As you say, and I think this is something to heed out there, he will not be full strength, unlikely to be full strength by week one. In that Beckham vein, uh, this is somebody that you'd be taking for that later impact. How much should this make you hesitate? You know, if... if if Parker falls a couple of rounds, if he's an 11th, 12th round pick, does that mean, hey, it's worth it because of the upside? Or alternatively, you know, is this something where you may look at a Greg Jennings or a Jarvis Landry or Kenny Stills or even a Jordan Cameron getting off to a hotter start because uh, Parker will be eased even more? Yeah, I think there's, there's a number of ways that we could take this discussion. From a fantasy football perspective, I think, you know, the players that Miami went out and acquired and seeing Jarvis Landry do well last year, there's a lot of options. And I don't see the Dolphins rushing Devontae Parker back, and I hope that's not the case. Um, fresh in sports fans' minds are probably situations like Kevin Durant where, you know, somebody's had a screw replaced and tries to come back a little bit too quickly and has further setbacks, and we just heard similar things from, um, you know, other players in the NBA, Joel Embiid as well. So, uh, but... On the flip side of that, we had this. We were having the same discussion this time last year on Julio Jones, um, who, and we know that from what the studies have suggested from Dr. Anderson and others, having a larger screw put in and having a bone graft procedure to help the healing of that is 
works really well, especially if you uh, if that timetable is is allowed to be long enough for him to fully recover, and not just from that injury, but also to allow him to build up his conditioning so we don't go through a Marvin Jones-like situation last year where he maybe tries to come back in that six to eight week time frame, has a compensatory injury that then costs him the rest of the season. So what you'd want to see from Devontae Parker is make sure that that bone graft and the and the area around the screw has fully healed and then give him time to condition slowly so that he's not immediately put back into a situation where he's got to go from uh, you know 0 to 100 from a conditioning standpoint. That's why I said I, 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 we're always going to say that the timetables we hear on these players are optimistic. Eight weeks was optimistic. I think you can plan on 10 to 12 weeks to expect Parker to be healed, and that's going to be right around week one. Um, so he's not going to participate in much training camp. They've got a number of other receiving options there. Uh, this could be an Odell Beckham situation where we start to see him uh, take over more and more targets and, and more and more catches by the middle in the second half of the season. Um, but I would not bank on Parker being of much value until you know week three, four, and beyond, and it may be far beyond that. Dr. Gene Brammel, footballguys.com. Check him out on Twitter at Gene Brammel. And we'll go from optimism, Gene, to pessimism. Uh, pessimism. I can speak English. Uh, at least I'm not paranoid. And if you are one of those super paranoid people that think you're being watched, well, that's going in your file. Dr. Gene, these are the jokes. Um, we've got a situation brewing in Denver. Let's go ahead and throw Dallas in it as well with Des Bryant and Demarius Thomas. From what I've gathered, and even Mike Kliss has reported this, I believe Ian Rappaport has said something on NFL Network, Demarius is going to hold out. Uh, if there's no new deal, which there probably is not going to be reached by July 15th, let's get the same, you kind of get the same vibe right now out of Dallas. Somebody's going to set the new wide receiver market for money. It might not be Des or Demarius. And Des, you know, the rumors out there, reports out there saying it goes into week one. Demarius, from what we've heard, maybe it's a couple of weeks from, from his side of things. He'll miss a couple of weeks of training camp. Gene, let's go back uh, to refresh people. Of course, fantasy owners really nervous and worried. Like Guys who hold out and miss training camp or hold out into the season, usually there's some sort of injury or they try to come back and they're, you know, they're not in football shape. They try to do too much too soon. How much of that is real? How much of that is perceived? And how worried are you if... From, and again, we're sitting here June 18th. We've got a, about a month to go before that franchise tag deadline to sign him to a new long-term deal. From what we know right now, both are far apart, and both may hold out. Demarius a couple weeks in training camp. Des may be into the regular season, week one. How concerned are you if they do hold out? Yeah, I think it's difficult to... to uh to say exactly how much you'd be concerned in those situations, but you hit on the right reasons to be concerned. Um, you know, you would you would hope that your elite skill position players stay in good enough condition so that when they start training camp or when they end the holdout and come back, um, you know, to, to take those first few training camp practices, that they're in good enough condition to handle the transition to football-related activity. Um, you know, there's you know, there's been some maturity questions about both of these guys, so maybe there's a little bit reason to be worried that they may not come uh, in good enough shape to avoid some of those things. But uh, it really hasn't been, you know, Demarius Thomas has had some issues with the foot and some ankle issues, but there hasn't been a long history of muscle strains and prolonged absences due to soft tissue injuries with both of these guys. So hopefully, as they're holding out and and before they come back, they're keeping their conditioning up so that these compensatory and reconditioning things are not going to be a problem for them. Gene, I just want to ask you a general question, uh, sort of follow up on your combined rookie draft board. Uh, and we are getting a lot of people, of course, people that are champions of different players on the offensive side of the ball. We're getting a lot of updates. You mentioned, you know, Mir Abdullah. And we're getting a lot of updates on on different offensive players. Not as many on how our star IDPs are coming along, except, of course, Dante Fowler. Uh, any nuggets, anything that has caught your eye over the last few weeks on rookie IDP, someone that maybe would move up or down on your board or a question that you were waiting and got a little more data on bringing these pictures slowly into focus? No, not too much. I still think, you know, 
for the most part, we're waiting to see exactly what, toward, what sort of role uh, guys like Stephon Anthony and Denzel Perriman and Paul Dawson and Bernardrick McKinney and Shaq Thompson are going to have. Um, and then I think we're also waiting to see just how many snaps a guy like Randy Gregory is going to get or maybe a Henry Anderson uh, or, you know, or those sorts of players. I haven't seen anything. You know, there's been no rave reviews like we're hearing with Amir Abdullah uh, and, uh, and, you know, and other guys on the offensive side of the ball. I'm um, just looking at this list here. I think the only thing that has caught my eye is, is, is Green Bay maybe not as willing to give Jake Ryan the reins at one inside linebacker position as early as it was suggested Ted Thompson might want to do in April and May. really seems like that's Clay Matthews' job to lose. Um, but I haven't seen anything that, that makes me want to jump one player up above another. You reading anything, seeing anything that has one guy moving up your Bloom 100 on a defensive no, actually, it, it's been pretty quiet. It's been quiet, yeah, and it seems like most of those players you rattled off a lot of uh, linebackers, you know, Perryman, Dawson, McKinney, Thompson, um, not really coming in focus. It seems like they're bringing them along more slowly. Um, but Dupree, it sounds like maybe, and of course, we're always comparing against low expectations because for a first round pick we basically are looking at him as a guy with a redshirt year, which is rare, but we even had the Steelers coach comment saying, hey, he was playing 3-4, even though we didn't coach him up to play 3-4, he was more of a 4-3 guy, so when he actually learned his position, that'll be good. Um, I think there was um, something, I mean, we, Kikaha had a, 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 you know, a few plays that stood out in some Saints OTAs. Of course, he'll be put under the gun pretty quickly, uh, but even like, you know, I, I, I can use this as a segue. Uh, to Shane Ray, even Shane Ray, like running with the second team, right? See? Exactly. I like that self-assured sniff too there, Bloom. You know, I'm a professional. <laughs> See, you didn't even notice I did that. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it is the Audible Live. Uh, Dr. Gene, a couple more for you. Appreciate sure. your time as always, and we'll cut you loose for tonight's show. Let's talk about uh, overweight and weight issues impacting players. One that I'm going to be specific with, and... I checked with a, a Carolina Panther insider, someone that works inside the building, uh, when I read and heard about Kevin Benjamin being overweight. And my guy that works inside the building was like, yeah, it looks like he you know, hit the buffet a little bit too much. Now it's, it's May and June, okay? I uh, got a little bit of a hamstring injury uh, as well. He's got eight or nine pounds to shed. 10 pounds, and Benjamin's already kind of a, a larger guy, right? So with this minor hamstring thing, with you know what my guy told me that yeah, he didn't miss the buffet, uh, certainly got in all his buffet reps this offseason, you know, what do we take of these weight issues? You know, we'll read other players that have gained good weight. You know, you said in your article, Bishop Sankey, I'm looking at you, but Benjamin gaining the bad weight. Uh, what should fantasy owners think here? Just interesting or something to keep an eye on? Yeah, I think it's something to keep an eye on. I think it, it calls into question what he does during the offseason, what his preparation is. Um, not whether he's interested in playing football, but you know what he did to keep his body in condition, the things we just talked about with Des Bryant and Demarius Thomas. And no, I can't draw a clear, straight line in ink between 10-pound weight gain, poor conditioning, and exactly, and um, hamstring soreness. But it stands to reason that poor conditioning leads to soft tissue issues when you first start coming back. So um, how difficult will it be for him to shed 8 to 10 pounds through the rest of mini camp season and training camp? Probably not that difficult if he's diligent in any way. Um, but it does put him at a little bit higher risk of certain types of injuries and you know, something that when it happens in this off season, you wonder whether or not it's going to happen in future off seasons, and how that'll affect him in um, in the years to come. So uh, we do know that he came back from that hamstring soreness in the last mini camp session. That's a good sign. Hopefully, we'll see him make it through the first couple of weeks of training camp without any major weight issues or soft tissue injuries. Um, and that's the same thing I'd say about any player in this situation: good weight versus bad weight. Gene, I'll, I'll just again t toss the, the open the floor a little bit, um, and just ask about any and maybe an offensive take or two. Just as you know, we're starting to during this time, this month coming up is when it's best. It's you can let the snow 
settle in your snow globe up here and see clearly uh, w these situations and, and what you think going in so you don't get thrown off too much. Has, has there been one or two situations? I know you, you hear what's going on out there. You've got your ear to the ground. You know what the conventional wisdom is right now, Gene. On the offensive side of the ball, you know, straight, straight up redraft fantasy, uh, you know, is there a player or two that you feel like the conventional wisdom is wrong about? Uh, no, not necessarily. I'm still in the beginning stages of looking through some of that stuff. I will tell you that I'm pretty intrigued about the Indianapolis offense this year. Um, Frank or Andre Johnson, you know, we always there's always there tends to be some veteran players, good veteran players that become an afterthought and fall into you know a round or two later than they probably should. And we saw it from Reggie Wayne a couple of years ago in this uh, with Andrew Luck. And I think you know I don't think Andre Johnson is done. I don't think Frank Gore is done. I think if that offensive line holds up, that's interesting to me. Um, I do think there's three injury situations that are probably being underreported, uh, and we'll find out for sure in the next few weeks. One of them is offensive, and I think that's Joyke Bell. Um, you know, with him still not being cleared to do much with the knee, the knee cleanout probably doesn't bother me that much. I don't really like hearing Achilles cleanout. He didn't have an Achilles tear, but when you get a you know, any procedure around the Achilles, basically they're trying to clean up some scar tissue. They're trying to handle bone spurs, uh, sometimes some bursa issues around that area. And when that happens, it takes time to heal. And we know that that area is probably not as strong as it once was. And I'm not saying that he's uh, doomed to tear his Achilles at some point this year, but I do think they're going to be pretty careful with him. And there are some guys on that depth chart right now, Amir Abdullah, Theo Riddick, um, that are going to make it hard for Joyk Bell to just walk back in and assume the role that he had at different points over the past couple of years. Um, I, I think you're going to want to see him on the field and hearing very good things about how he looks before I would trust. I might even. I don't. I'm not saying I would go so far as to take him off the board because at some point there's going to be uh, a place where the value meets the risk. But I really don't like what I'm hearing so far about Bell this entire offseason. That may change very quickly in August, but that's a situation that uh, I think we could hear a whole lot more about come training camp. Uh, and then two defensive guys. One of them, your guy, Brandon Marshall, out there in Denver. Um, see, so I, you know, we knew that he had a midfoot sprain, and then to hear that it was a Liz Frank issue, and then to hear that he had surgery, and surgery not until March. Um, one, Liz Frank surgeries mean that there was a pretty significant injury there to need to have it fixed surgically. And then these guys are immobilized for a long period of time, and it takes some time after that surgery. It's a slow rehab process. He's not been cleared to run yet six weeks before training camp, and I think there's a I'm, I would be surprised if he didn't start camp on the pup list, and I there's a chance that he's going to still be on the pup list by the time camp ends. Now, there's been some optimism there, but uh, I think it's an underreported situation, and I, I'm going to be happy if we see Marshall back sometime in training camp. And the other one is Vontaze Perfect. We talk about the Bengals and Marvin Lewis a lot on this show as, you know, you're just not going to get any information. It's all undisclosed. They're trying to minimize and, and demur and, and, and try to keep things from the media. When Marvin Lewis sits in front of the media and says he's got a long ways to go, he's basically telling you don't count on Vontis Perfect being uh, a part of this defense in week one. And, you know, microfracture surgery in January, this is another situation you're looking at an eight- to nine-month rehab, and that puts you in that, you know, late July, August, early September range at absolute best. And we've seen players recently, as recently as Anthony Spencer, not recover for many more months than that after microfracture surgery. So, um, you know, at least from a linebacker perspective, those are two guys that I think – it's far from guaranteed that we'll see them start for their defenses and anchoring the front seven come week one of this year. Yeah, and in Wade Phillips 3-4, Brandon Marshall is essentially what you would call a tackling machine, mm -hmm. if available, because uh, everything's going to get funneled to him, people. That is the Audible Live. It is, uh, well, we're not done yet. We've still got some news items to get to. But Dr. Gene Brammel, we appreciate your time as always. Check out his work at footballguys.com and check him out on Twitter at Gene Brammel. Now, Gene, I have a... Uh, a father question to ask you before we let you go. I'm going to put you on the spot here, my man. Okay. Uh, my son, Liam, turned 16 today. Woo! I yay, Liam. 16. We had a rule in place, uh, and it will be for all three of our children. Uh, you know, you can't date until you're 16. So Liam had his first date last night when he was, you know, 15 and 364 days. Uh, d did you, because I talked about that on my show today on ESPN Denver, and it seemed like everybody was like, yeah, I could date when I want. Do you, do you have that rule on place? Did you when you were when you were a young Gene Bramall, 16 years old, looking at the ladies? I mean, did did you have to wait to date? I can't remember. 
I honestly can't remember. Um, I can't remember. That's probably not good that it was such a unmemorable situation that I can't recall. Right. Uh, I have not, you know, uh, my oldest is now 11. We have not yet gotten to the point where we've thought about putting those safeguards in place, I guess, as you would call it. But I'm getting there soon, I think. I, I don't know. <laughs> and here I thought this was going to be a question okay. to answer. Anything up to three or four times a day is totally normal. <laughs> yes, that's all normal. Bloom, you were a lover of the ladies, still are, baby. Uh, did you have Did you have a dating? I, I had no. I you know what I had. I did not have much on my dance card in high school. That's a long story. Long, with which would lead to many longer stories. This is truly on the couch. This is where we really, really get to on the couch stuff here. But my, I grew up um, in a house with one rule, which was don't lie. Uh, so. Uh, my sister, for instance, I know, um, you know, there was no sort of date that after this point you're allowed, to, you know, opposite sex and things like that. So I, I think it's one of those things that probably the more you forbid it and the more you try to build a wall around it, the more attention and curiosity you will draw to it anyway. So hence back to the way I was raised, which was as a parent, you always want to know what your kid's doing, even if it makes you really freaked out. Yeah, get get ready to get freaked out, fellas. <laughs> get get ready, Doctor Gene. Thanks, brother. We'll uh, be good. We'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Freaked good night, out. boys. <laughs> and there we have it. Uh, it is the Audible Live Thursday night. YouTube.com slash Football Guys D O T C O M. Bloom. Let's go through some news items here. Uh, we'll get through a few, you know, thirty minutes or so here yeah. in discussing what's going on around the National Football League. And to alert our listening audience to iTunes, not our viewers here on YouTube, but we do, you know, we're going to have 10 episodes a week now, not eight. It's going to be 10 per week when the regular season gets here because of our two daily fantasy football shows coming up on the Audible. Also, we will be going around the horn, reaching out to some beat writers here uh, over this next month and a half, uh, you know, leading up. It gets difficult, you know, during the preseason, stuff like that. So we'll get you some beat writers in. We'll get you those hot takes and that information preseason watch list bloom we're gonna kick that off uh you know in about a month we'll start recording those towards the end of july it'll be fantastic as always but the reason i bring this up is because i had to get kevin fishbane on my show this week from chicagofootball.com former pro football weekly we talked about john fox i miss john fox i, I really do uh you know gary kubek very businesslike very nice man uh but foxy you know a little <clears throat> well, personality there with John Fox. But one thing we know with Fox, and, and we know it well, is two big believers in Cody Latimer, who looks fantastic at, at Broncos camp. But point is, let's talk about Kevin White and okay. where fantasy owners should look at White with this system and with John Fox, who doesn't trust rookies, okay? He doesn't trust rookies. And we look for the drum beats and the OTAs, you know, the, the standard OTA, like this X player is working hard and looking good. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, where the reps at, what are guys doing? Kevin White and, and reaching out to Fishbane, who you know has worked closely and uh, with the Bears and watches practice. Nothing better than boots on the ground. White's not getting the work, man. It's Eddie Royal coming in. And White's competing with Marcus Wilson. And White is much more talented. I like Wilson. You like Wilson. White is much more talented. And maybe it's the, at the end of the day, the talent just wins out. But this is John Fox. And I don't necessarily trust the fact that if Eddie Royal's looking as damn good as he is, you know, back with Gase. Gase was a wide receivers coach when Royal was in Denver years ago. Royal knows the system, you know, and, and we've seen that resurgence from Eddie Royal. Right now, what we have to go on is it's Alshon, Jeffrey, and Royal as the one and the two. Black Unicorn didn't want to get fined, so Martellus Bennett is there as well. We know the tight end will be involved in an Adam Gase system. What we saw in Denver was Adam Gase's offense. Don't do the Pete Manning was the OC. No, he wasn't. This was Gase's offense. Now let's put those numbers with the Bears. Let's look at Matt Forte. Let's look at what Cutler can do. But I want to talk about Kevin White. Are you concerned that there could be a, a hiccup in the production, a delay in the production, you know, maybe in a non-injury situation? It's like Odell Beckham Jr., where we had said in preseason watch list, we had like, this guy's amazing, he's just hurt. Well, White's amazing, but he's with a coach that maybe takes a little time to warm up to those rookies. Is that a concern for you with White and where you're considering him in fantasy drafts right now? It's in the picture. Uh the John Fox rookie thing 
is tough to navigate because the most famous examples we can remember, like Deshaun Foster, D'Angelo Williams, Jonathan Stewart, it was the running backs. It bothered us uh, at many junctures. A younger running back was the best running back they had, and he wouldn't play him. Uh, will that happen with Kevin White this year? Well, it did happen with Von Miller. You know, Von Miller started 15 games his rookie year. There was no easing Von Miller in. He was a very impactful rookie. Um, and like you said, it may come down to the talent. And I would say this, if you're targeting Kevin White, there's a point in your draft around the seventh round. Those of you that are just getting into drafts, I'm sure you're noticing this. Around the seventh round, it's kind of every man for himself, every drafter for themselves. Every Floodgates open. Well, and it's like, take who you want. You know, if you want Duke Johnson, or especially the rookies, if you want Nelson Aguilar, if you want Brashad Perryman, if you want Kevin White, um, now De- Devontae Parker may fall a little bit, or or anybody else. You know, there's, there's the veteran you've got your eyes on, Marcus Colston. You, you have players going in the 11th that sometimes go in the 7th. You have players going in the 7th that sometimes go in the 11th. And Kevin White, if he was a priority for you in that 7th or 8th round, it's because of his talent. Uh, and also, you know, Jake, there are worse quarterback situations than Jay Cutler. And you know with Alshon Jeffrey and and the guys you mentioned, Bennett and Royal White, should be able to be in one-on-one situations where his talent uh, should rise to the, to the surface pretty quickly. His physical abilities combined with his aggressive style of play. Um, I still think that, you know, I just mentioned two names right off the top of my head there, Aguilar and Perryman. I mean, if I'm if I've got a slot for my unknown ceiling rookie wide receiver, seventh eighth round, once I have my starters, my my core filled, go with Aguilar or Perryman. Uh, Perryman, you're going to get into that Tory Smith role. Has perfect skills for what they need in Baltimore. Even if the rest of his game is still real rough around the edges, is a number three receiver or flex play you're just throwing in and hoping for the big play. Aguilar, we're getting a great a great chock full of information report from Jeff Mosher. Uh, Eagles beat writer saying, I don't see any reason to believe that Jordan Matthews is going to be used a lot on the outside this year. Well, who is <laughs> Nelson Aguilar and, and an some, answer. yeah. And some Riley Cooper and, and some Josh Huff who's coming along. But uh, there was some talk on, on another article, Jeff McClain that, that side by side, Aguilar just looks so much more polished than Huff. Huff has a lot, a lot of toughness in his game, a, a lot of energy in his game, but still rough around the edges from a skill standpoint where Aguilar is already silky smooth. And I believe Moser said that Aguilar, comparing him to Macklin, is not off base. And if anything, he's more elusive and more dangerous in the open field than Macklin. So, uh, you know, I can get Jordan Matthews in the fourth or I can get Aguilar in the seventh. That's an easy call as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, you know, I, I think that what concerns me more, honestly, than John Fox's history with rookies is just – what happens with Jay Cutler this year? And, and and this is one cease because of your years of experience covering Cutler and how you can separate what is reputation and what is what we believe about Cutler and, and what is true about Cutler, or at least what was true, and you can extrapolate that from his years of uh, in, in Chicago. But I, I've said this many times, and I'll come back to it. This, to me, encapsulates the whole situation. The next time Jay Cutler gets benched is the last time he'll get benched for the Bears. That's, I mean, you know. Right. That's right. it. And the, and Jimmy Clausen, I mean, he's probably better than he was when he was with Carolina, but that's that's a problem. And also just this team going into dumpster fire mode. You know, um, they're changing over on offense. They're changing over on defense. Uh, and Cutler, as we, we've said this, teams take on the personality of their coach and their quarterback. We don't want them taking on the personality of the quarterback in this case because we saw it when Jimmy Clausen got on the field last year, the whole energy of the team picked up so that's what makes me honestly more worried about investing in any chicago bear except maybe matt forte in a second because we've already seen that he can continue to be matt forte through the rough seas but chicago's offense in general and you mentioned it bennett royal who has tons of chemistry with cutler had his best season of his career with cutler in 91 Denver. catches yeah, and you remember what he did the first night of the season against uh, Oakland. You know, it came out like a against like, Angelo Hall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just destroyed him. Uh, so unless we are projecting Chicago to be a 4,500, 4,700 passing yard offense, where are these numbers going to come from? Uh, you know, if Bennett gets his and Royal gets his and Jeffrey gets his, what is left over for White? Unless you're projecting somebody and Forte will get his. So, you know, you can pencil in Forte for four, 500. You're going to pencil in Bennett for five, six, 700. You're going to pencil in Royal for four, five, 600. You're going to pencil in 
uh, you know, Jeffrey for 11, 1200, you know, unless you're projecting this offense to be a juggernaut of a pass offense, which means you're projecting Jay Cutler to turn his career around, then wh- why, where's, where's the win uh, for Kevin White? So uh, I, the Bears just feel like a proceed with cost and situation. I can tell a story where all this talent and Jay Cutler gets it together, but haven't we been telling that story year after year and it still doesn't come true? Yeah, yeah, it's it's there's wishing and there's hoping and then there's reality. Let's be pragmatic with this situation. And you don't want them taking on the person out of their quarterback because you know, people you gotta cut down on the smoking. You know, we're not yeah. gonna judge, but you know, there's a bunch of smokers mm-hmm. in Chicago. We don't uh, don't necessarily need that. Anyway, the bears. The bears. <laughs> uh <laughs> wonderful Stanley Cup uh celebration. Yeah. Bloom. It feels so good, Bloom, to be well rounded. Who knew? It is I was gonna say you just you you were you're being sincere. Hey, the Blackhawks and as a uh, grew up as a massive fan of the Mary Lemieux Penguins. Um but the back Blackhawks, what they've done last six years, three championships. That's that's a dynasty, and they're doing it with mental toughness. It's really fun to watch teams that just can rattle their opponent, not with any particular play or specific skills or talents, just with this undying belief that they are going to find a way to beat you. And eventually it, the crack, you know, it's like water speaking. So the flooded basement just has this on my mind, man. It, you know, water's going to find that crack. It's yeah. going to find that crack. And, and that's how the Blackhawks have been. So cheers to the Blackhawks. Cheers to the Warriors. Cheers to LeBron James. Oh, man. And if you don't appreciate what he did in this finals, then the, it's your loss, honestly. Um, but the finals this year, since you just brought it up, Cease, the finals of both of these sports were worthy of final series, which is not something we can say every year, and certainly not in the way that they have it trading off uh, you know, one night NBA, one night NHL, where you have contrasting styles, you have rich backstory, you have both teams playing with inspired intensity, you know, really digging down and and leaving everything they have, uh, and, and it it was it was a real joy to get to watch them. And we, you know, we can only hope we had a, obviously a great Super Bowl to get these things rolling. And when the Pittsburgh Pirates play in the World Series, they play the Kansas City Royals. Uh, you know, I'll meet up with Heath, Heath Cummings now. CBS will do like a home and home series or something like that. It is good, Cease. And I did notice that when you tweeted something out about like NBA talk coming up. On Twitter, a few people are like, I don't know you anymore. Who are you, man? <laughs> when Dr. Gene said something about Joel Embiid, I was like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's continue the conversation back to football. And I want to talk about Mike Evans. Now, he's playing and lining up primarily. And, uh, you know, media policy is different in different cities because <laughs> you can actually say something. Uh, but lining up at split end. Uh, for people that maybe aren't as familiar with an X receiver, an X receiver usually is opposite the tight end in the formation. He's always on the line of scrimmage, okay? So usually the corner, especially if you're up against a guy like Mike Evans, you're going to be playing off coverage. You don't want to – Evans will throw you out of the way, right? He'll just toss you and get in his route wide open. So you're going to play off him, which leads to more you know, quick passes, shorter routes. Um, and if you try to body him up, well, then just go over, your, over his head. Uh, and, and you'll win with a guy like Mike Evans. It's split in, not the Z that he played as a rookie, which is usually on the right side. It's always off of the line of scrimmage, back uh, a few steps. So it's a different look. And one where it's more aggressive. If you're the split end, you're the more aggressive guy. And you know people saying, oh, well, Jameis Winston and rookie quarter, these are the hot takes. I'm not going to name names, Bloom. But these are the hot takes like, well, rookie quarterback struggled. <laughs> the design of the split end is to be the aggressor in the receiving game, to line up on the line of scrimmage, to dare the opponent to play press man or press bail against you. And Evans will win. He'll win if you play off coverage. He'll win if you play man, man, press, man, bail. It doesn't matter. Mike Evans will win. You look at the ADP right now. It's wide receiver 12. I've heard people. And, and again, you know, I don't. People always like, oh, what are you on Twitter? I look at my at replies, and, and that's it. I don't really see what, and that's just me. That's the way people I have to. People still use love it. you, everybody. Yes, love I, I love everyone out there. But when I hear people like, I don't know why the ADP for Mike Evans is so high. Really? Because it's above Emmanuel Sanders, where it should be. Sanders going to catch about 70, 75 passes this year, maybe a thousand yards, maybe. It's above Brandon Cooks, who you know we don't really know about yet, like Cooks, but still. 
It's above Kelvin Benjamin, who we talked about earlier, Andre Johnson, Jordan Matthews, we talked about Nelson Aguilar earlier, above Julian Edelman. Above, what, what is the problem here? What is the problem with Mike Evans' ADP? I look at it and say, if I get him at 303, good. If he's wide receiver 12, if I can get Mike Evans at wide receiver 12, I don't think that's overpaying, overvaluing. Oh, hot sports takes, rookie quarterback struggle. Uh, let's look at Jameis Winston and his ability to throw into coverage. Uh, he doesn't, he's not scared at all to challenge a defense vertically. And again, with Evans as a quarterback, it's one of the easiest reads you can make, Bloom. You look over at the split end. If the guy's off, you throw short. If the guy's close, you throw long. It's easy, and Evans can win that. Also makes him a little bit more difficult to double team because you can run those shorter routes. And that second guy isn't going to be, you know, you're not bracketing him at a five-yard in route. You know what I mean? I, I love where Mike Evans is at, even with the rookie quarterback and Jameis Winston. Bloom, your thoughts on this Tampa Bay second-year pro? Yes, and I think that if you have a top five pick and you're going running back early, you're taking a Peterson, you're taking a Le'Veon Bell, you're taking a Jamal Charles, uh, Evans is your target uh, at the end of the second round, unless something silly happens like C.J. Anderson slides. Um, you're going to get an Evans, maybe somebody that we're talking about in the top five or six wide receivers by the end of the season. And I think that we saw Evans dominance in the red zone and I know there's a lot of oh you know what do you have 12 touchdowns last year and the regression to the mean and so on we don't know what his mean is and we certainly you like you say cease uh struggling worky quarterbacks could be a problem is he going to struggle more than Glennon did and uh, McCown did now I know the offensive line is an issue but Jameis Winston basically rolled out of bed two years ago and sent took Florida State to a national championship and then with a much lesser crew last year got them to the first playoff so he can elevate his team and there's been nothing but reports that he's the first one there he's greeting everybody at practices he's doing wind sprints with offensive linemen this is his team already and as I've mentioned before I think on the couch that James Winston's the kind of quarterback that when he looks at the field the field says throw 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 he's he's aggressive he's optimistic he throws his guys open. He gives his guys chances to win. Ask Johnny Manziel how that goes with Mike Evans. So I see Mike Evans' 12 touchdowns last year as a starting point for what he could be this year. And yes, I do think James Winston could throw 25 touchdowns this year. I think James Winston could get into DFS streaming consideration easily this year. Look at their schedule and look at who he has to throw to. Evans, Jackson, Austin Spring, Jenkins. Tim Wright's back. Cease, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> traded him for a future pick, which turned yeah. out to be Tim Wright. Yeah, a yeah. future player, I should say. Yeah, Trey Flowers, I think, was basically who they got for uh, Logan Mankins, the Arkansas D. And I know Clayton Gray will like that one. A anyway, um, I, I think Evans is one of those players that we really don't know how good he's going to be this year. We don't know how he's going to be with a better quarterback, a Dirk Cutter, also. Uh, and you know, th this is a guy for fantasy that has a dream trump card in the red zone. He is next to impossible to stop and it's Jameis Winston yeah and Jameis Winston is a good qu quarterback he's a good passer he's a good field general he's a good general of an offense and he's going to make it work um, and he's going to give Evans those chances to win one-on-one -on -one because that is the style of quarterback that he is and the Bucks knew what they're getting and I like Vincent Jackson it's the sixth seventh round too yeah Jackson still has a lot of game left and we're gonna see that so even Austin Ferry Jenkins if I ever thought he could stay healthy so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very optimistic about Tampa's offense, and, except for the running game. But I'm very optimistic about Jameis Winston and what he'll do for Evans and Vincent Jackson. And I think getting Evans at the end of the second round, you know, we could be watching the numbers start to roll in by week five or week six. And, and people who took Des Bryant or Demarius Thomas or Calvin Johnson might be looking at Mike Evans' numbers and saying, I could have got it around later. Could have had that guy. It's your fishing story. Uh, and I look at Jameis Winston, a couple of things you brought up, Bloom. The offensive line, horse, shut your mouth. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Winston's basically Ben Roethlisberger, if he hits. Well, Ben Roethlisberger's not really had a good offensive line, and things have worked out. I also look at the confidence. And, you know, LeBron James saying he's the best player in the world, and people are like, why would he say that? Why would you have so a little humility, please? No, no. And not with my quarterbacks. When Cam Newton believes in himself and, you know, we got the reports coming out like, oh, the 
the fake smile from Nolan Rocky. Thanks for that, Nolan. Uh, it was a ghost, by the way. Anyway, um, when Jameis Winston says at the combine and tells me I'm going to win the Super Bowl this year, I love that. You know, it's not going to happen, but I love that. So when this kid makes some mistakes, is he going to go into a shell? Is just Jameis Winston even know what the hell a shell is? Or is just he going to be the crabs guy? just cracking open those crag legs? That's it. Crab shell. Uh, he just, walked right into it. That's that's what we call the softball bloom. Yeah. The softball. Um, yeah, he's going to keep firing and he's going to keep firing at Mike Evans. Got zero issue with his uh, current average draft position. Audible live every Thursday. Listen, Bloom, we've doing, been doing this uh, 11 years and it's been fantastic, been fun. We have uh, a great chemistry, something that in, in radio and in podcasting, so very, very difficult to find. We also have longtime listeners who love to remind us of things. And I love that. Okay. Hold our feet to the fire. And as I often said, I'm not right on every player. I miss on players and I learn more from my misses than I do from my hits. Uh, we did have a, an emailer here, Bloom. I'm looking at it. Uh, Bruce, who had, ta- who had asked a question about Duke Johnson. He said, I'll save this. Uh, I'll save my Lions running back question for later. And he says, Bloom, by the way, because Matt and I go back and forth on some running backs once in a while. He says, I want to remind you that neither you or Matt have ever been right about a Lions running back. Because Kevin Smith, I didn't like him. Matt loved him. Kevin Smith was a slappy. Mikel Ashore, I loved him. Matt was cool on him. Mikel Ashore, slappy. Um, I think both of us like Kevin Jones, and, well, he got hurt, whatever. Javid Best. Javid Best. Um, I believe both of us liked him. Didn't didn't work out so well. Injury, whatever. And then now Amir Abdullah, where we sit on Amir Abdullah versus Tevin Coleman. So to Bruce's point, we'll get to the Amir Abdullah thing later. And, and Matt's not with us tonight, so we will discuss that at a later point. But Duke Johnson here. And we're hearing some very, very interesting news and reports. Maybe not necessarily that shocking when you knew what his skill set was. Duke Johnson playing a little wide receiver. Uh, receiving uh, repetitions at wide receiver in John DeFilippo's, <laughs> DeFilippo uh, said that's part of the plan for one Duke Johnson. Now, we know that Isaiah Crowell, as talented as he is and instinctive and powerful and nasty as a runner, He's not a not a great receiver, and I, I love Carell. Matt loved Carell, so you know we were both on, on board with him there. Bloom, I know you loved him last year too, as that UDFA. But Duke Johnson here, what's the real role for this guy? Again, it's Cleveland, so you know we're not looking at the most high powered offense. But Duke Johnson certainly is the three down player. Now, Bloom, I see him as a part time guy. I see him as a player that you can use in space, use him on third down, certainly as a receiving threat. The fact that he might be, you know, a little split out wide or in the slot, good. When I read that story, I, 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 and already knowing what Corell is, and not having any misconceptions about like, well, Corell's Corell's just going to get better and do every. Corell is your natural thumper, not really your receiver. Johnson's a better weapon in space than Corell is, and Corell's a damn fine runner who does a good job of running through defenders. But what's the role and what should fantasy owners be looking at here with Duke Johnson? And do you disagree with me? Do you think that Johnson could be that full-time guy? Well, I do think that his role is subject to grow. Uh, And I do see him as not all that different, although I think that Gene's caution about Joyke Bell uh, underscores why we like Amir Abdullah, say, two, three rounds before we like Duke Johnson. But I, I don't see anything wrong with taking both of them, even at current ADP. Because do the math. And sometimes you have to just not complicate things. Don't overthink things, all right? First and foremost, Duke Johnson. And he was, if David Johnson wasn't in this class, we'd have been raving about Duke Johnson as a receiver out of the backfield. We should have been anyway. I mean, we, and I'm sure we did. Um, he runs routes very well. He has terrific hands and ball skills. He's terrific after the catch. And as you said, you can line him up. You can do some things with him as a wide receiver in addition to being a receiver out of the backfield. And immediately at OTAs in Cleveland, you hear, wow, Duke Johnson catching so many passes. Yep. Now you start to do the math. And I got into it with a few people about this because I said he could easily catch 80 balls this year. And of course, how many times does that happen? And how hard is it for running backs to do that? Well, first of all, the game is changing. All right. Running backs catching 60, 70, 80 balls isn't as crazy as it used to be. Here's the other thing. Look at Cleveland's roster. 
Who is going to be the compelling target that keeps Duke Johnson from being a big option in this pass offense? Is it going to be Dwayne Bowe? Brian Hartline? Rob Hausler? You do even John DeFilippo, if I'm saying that right. I mean, whoever it is, if you want to keep your job in the NFL, you keep going to what works. I think they're going to go into the season, and the name Giovanni Bernard has been mentioned often, and that's who I have Duke Johnson next to in my rankings. I have Johnson as about a six-round value. You can get him eighth or ninth, I would imagine, in, in most drafts. In PBR drafts, he should be uh, a high priority because I think 50 catches is basically a given. In, in Giovanni Bernard terms, 50 catches. That's basically where Bernard has been with Jeremy Hill, uh, you know, being the big back. And Isaiah Crow won't be successful to the tune that Jeremy Hill has been, but he, he'll hold that down and we'll see what Terrence West does. I think that's the plan going in. The plan going in is a Giovanni Bernard kind of role. But Duke Johnson can change that very quickly. That's the thing that we forget is we, we get settled in our heads with the roles and the way the pie is going to be sliced up from our outlook in the preseason, but it changes during the season and it changes instantly like a, like a pendulum that just that swings from one end all the way to the other where this player was just going to get one or two or three touches in a week or seven or 10 touches in a week. And then everyone gets a load of the player and they're like, Whoa, yeah, I guess we need to use that player more. Duke Johnson. If we're going to make a list of the five or 10 most likely players, Amir Abdullah is on that list, although he might not even need that. Players that can just create their own massive opportunity. I think Duke Johnson can absolutely do that. And with that 50 catch median, um, there's no there's no artificial limit on the catches that a number of I mean sure he's not gonna catch 150 passes, okay? But if he is one of the things that works in their offense, then they're gonna continue to go to him. And especially if he's a hurry up running back, uh, two minute drill, you could see him get two, three, four catches on a drive. Because that's what's going to work in this offense. Oh, by the way, McCown or Manziel, whoever the quarterback is, again, you know, you're not going to see a lot of success throwing downfield to Bo and Hartline. Maybe you'll take some shots to Gabriel or Benjamin. Fine. But in between, you have to move the ball. And let's remember, this is a very good offensive line. So what opportunity Duke Johnson gets on screen passes, what opportunity he does get as a runner between the tackles or in space, he will also benefit from that. So uh, I, I think Duke Johnson's being very uh, undersold right now. I, you know, For instance, I would never take Shane Vereen over him. I, that's crazy. I think that Duke Johnson, as a, his floor is Shane Vereen this year, uh, just to put it in perspective. So Duke Johnson should absolutely be one of your targets. You know, uh, and it'll take uh, Johnny Manziel obviously playing better, but that style of quarterback, a Manziel yeah, style yeah. bloom, Shotgun. I'm I'm more excited about Johnson if if Manziel can pull his head out of his ass and you know stay mature and and be better on the field. The money signal, you know. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna take the, the reins here, Cease, because I've got a question from a listener who's been very uh, very kind and okay. polite, and and this revolves around a player that we love to talk about on the show. This is a question from Justin Dorb. Dorbant, who uh, is um, one of my friends on Facebook and gets to see the other side of Bloom. And, and uh, he asked me this question, and I'll give you the parameters of his specific situation, but really it's a, a jumping off point to talk larger uh, scale about these players. 12 team keeper, 0.5 PPR, all touchdown, six points. Wide receiver, tight end flex, can only keep keepers for one season. Uh, the choices he has are DeAndre Hopkins in the 10th, Travis Kelsey in the 13th, or Jarvis Landry in the 21st. Uh, the draft order is generated randomly. They have to declare keepers before they know their draft order. Um, he's pretty sure that Gronkowski is going to be kept for a second. So that pays into his decision with respect to Kelsey for a 13th. He likes Kelsey in the 13th because of positional scarcity. Hopkins and Landry are great value. But uh, Kelsey, he thinks, can provide a bigger advantage. Is Kelsey the right move? What might he be overlooking? No, that is the right move. And Kelsey is the right move because of that position scarcity, but not only because of that. Let's get Hopkins out of the way. Their quarterbacks are terrible. All right. And Hopkins is amazingly talented. And yes, he could produce some numbers, but I don't want to look at that passing game and be excited about much of anything there. With Landry, again, we love Landry. I really respect Ryan Tannehill and making more steps, putting better weapons around him, moving Mike Wallace on. Things are looking up for Landry. It's in the 21st. You can get Landry back. Kelsey with the addition of Macklin. Now, the reports come out about, you know, they want Alex Smith to throw longer. Yeah, uh, you know, 
I want a bunch of gold. Uh, it's you know, it take some time. We got to work for it. But are we going to see that? Here's what Macklin will do. He'll stretch the field, open up things underneath, or at least in the seam, because Kelsey has that speed to attack the deep middle seam and be a weapon there. Will Smith be bold? Perhaps his boldness, Bloom, isn't necessarily going to Macklin deep, but maybe Kelsey in the seam. Maybe Kelsey underneath as a safer target. You know, Alex Smith doesn't like to feel uncomfortable as a quarterback. So to me, this is Kelsey, and it's a it's an easy decision for Kelsey. Your thoughts, Bloom? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, Hopkins is interesting, and the fact that you can only keep the players for one year helps because then you have to think about, well, who's got the higher overall ceiling between Hopkins uh, and Kelsey and Landry? Uh, and I, I think that makes Hopkins versus Kelsey tougher. But Kelsey ha is part of that unknown ceiling crew to an extent because we find out this offseason that he was, what, like a month? Uh, after he was cleared to run, right? The beginning of this last season was a month after he was cleared to run. And how I uh, cue up the montage of Bloom. Like, what are they going to use Kelsey more? Come on. How can you only throw to Kelsey? He's the best player in your offense. What pass catcher downfield are you doing? Obviously, Charles is the better player, but you see what I'm getting at. There was m so much frustration, so much banging our head against the desk last year. Like, it's so clear what Kelsey can do. Why can't they use him more? That's what's coming this year. And as you said, bringing up the name Macklin, that stretches defenses. You have to honor Macklin's speed. So that opens up the middle of the field more for Kelsey. It could be very, very good. Uh, you know, He could easily finish as the number two tight end this year. Uh, not because Jimmy Graham's going to be way below expectations. But I, I, I also agree that... You know, I, I would have Hopkins as roughly a late third round pick, and I would have Kelsey as roughly uh, a early fourth. I mean, early fifth, late fourth. Um, and projecting, I mean, the three round difference is almost inconsequential, except that um, with Gronkowski being kept, uh, and if you know that Kelsey's the the tight end that you want, then <clears throat> you're going to have to probably overpay for him. So I think that that makes it easy. I, I think there's a you could defend Hopkins. I think it's harder to defend Landry in a 0.5 PPR, uh, but I, I don't think there's anything overlooking here. And I think that Kelsey's one of those players that if he is above expectations by week two or week three, and we're looking, we're saying not Gronk, Graham, Kelsey, we're saying Gronk, Kelsey, Graham, no one should be surprised. Well, and Bloom, you bring up your Facebook friend. I want, I want everyone to know, Bloom, that we both have our own rules for social networking, yes. right? Because you always chuckle when I say, I only read my at replies. It's it's a time thing. Like I don't Bloom, you love to mingle. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I'm I'm a little more antisocial, if you can believe that, being a radio personality. Um, and I just if you got a question, I'll answer it. I'm not really gonna jump into a bunch of conversations because I'm talking all the time and and all that. So anyway, um, but on Facebook, you are you, right? And, yeah. and Facebook is you and Twitter is business. For me, Facebook is kind of business, a couple personal things once in a while kids pictures or whatever but it's mostly like check out my article check out my radio show stuff like that and you know it's it's using our tools to reach our audience in our own ways yes absolutely no and uh, okay i mean look on twitter i'm football and it's topics that are inter interesting to me related to football and then at, i'll at reply people about any topic you know if you actually look through my twitter timeline that's not just tweets that are meant for everybody to see uh, you'll find some other stuff but facebook no football unless it's something that is one of those topics that i find interesting that football's related to the most football you post is when you post a picture of miles in the champ bailey jersey that yeah exactly him. that he loves so much <laughs> yes he likes all those jerseys Yes. So, you know, if you do friend me on Facebook, don't be surprised if there's no football at all, uh, because that that's how I roll there. But it's great. And, and, and likewise, I mean, probably on Facebook, I'd say maybe two, one third of the people that are my friends on Facebook are actually people that I have some connection to separate from football guys. And then two thirds are people that know me from football guys. And everyone's been ter terrific sports. And I, we get, you know, we do full contact sword and shield, just like I do on fantasy sports uh, on Facebook on any, any number of issues of the moment. Uh, and it's, 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 I just love the people. Like you said, Cease, I, I like to mingle, but it, it, it's a very, I feel very fortunate to have come of age at this time, it's funny, Cease, because sometimes I reflect back to our first weeks of the five minute drill. And remember, we got, I, we all got iPhones. Me and you, Floody, all got iPhones. I was like, right. wow, this is the cool. It's like, you know, when you got your first pair of Air Jordans or something like, like this is so neat. It was such a novelty. 
Uh, and little did we know that it was really going to change everything. And we, luckily, we've been able to benefit from it. I saw, by the way, speaking of getting off on, on tangents, President Obama is going to be on Mark Maron's podcast. So I just want to say, and any sitting president is always welcome on the Audible. Always. So no matter your <laughs> politics, no matter your party, whether we voted for you or not. So if, if, if this can get back to President Obama and part of the lame duck second term that he's going to start doing the podcast circuit. We know he does a bracket. We can help him draft his team. A little fancy draft in the White House. I, you Come know, on, POTUS. Be down. It, you know, again, it doesn't matter what party, whether or not we voted or whether we backed the corporations that got you there. Uh, Bloom, let's wrap up the Audible tonight. Yes, please. We should. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. wrap it up with a little Le'Veon Bell discussion. Super quick, um, because we do have an interesting news item about Le'Veon Bell. There's no date set for Le'Veon Bell's appeal. Uh, he has not had the appeal set of his three-game suspension heard at this point. Doesn't know when the appeal will be scheduled. There's kind of a theory, Bloom, and I want to float the, I want you to put your lawyer hat on for me, please, uh, that th his lawyers, that Le'Veon Bell's lawyers are kind of letting this drag out a little bit longer so that they can prove, like, look how long our client's been out of trouble and his nose is clean and he's an upstanding citizen who had this camp for kids and, you know, did some charity thing or whatever. But they're kind of stretching it out so that they can show that Bell is staying out of trouble for a longer period of time. Do you buy that? Would it work? And could we actually see? By the way, you're drafting Le'Veon. If he's got three games, you're still drafting him in the top three picks of most every draft out there, okay? Yes. You're drafting Le'Veon Bell. Don't even think, don't, oh, I'm a three to, what am I going to do? It grabs some slapping off the waiver wire, whatever. Like, you're going to have Le'Veon Bell. If you're drafting the first three picks, I don't care if it's a full three games, you're taking Le'Veon Bell. But does this thing get reduced to two? And would the lawyers, would that strategy work? Kind of, you know, not scheduling the appeal so they can have a little bit longer for their client to keep his nose clean. Well, it can't hurt to try. I don't know what the internal logic of appealing a penalty to the body that determined what the penalty was in the first place is. So sure. I mean, and honestly, if we go back and revisit Le'Veon Bell and the incident, Bell and Blunt, it was kind of innocent in a way in that Bell didn't realize that um, being high from smoking marijuana was something that was covered under in the influence in the DUI, the UI part. Uh, he said, I smoked two hours ago. I'm going to catch the team plane. Why would I drive high? Come on. What do you mean? It was two hours ago. So, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like this is some sort of pathological part of a larger uh, pattern of issues. Uh, so it's possible. But look, like you said, draft some slappy or something. Draft D'Angelo Williams. He's still going in the 15th round or later. Yeah, last pick of your draft, D'Angelo Williams. Boom. Yeah, you got your or, or even if it's 13th, 14th, 15th, just to make sure you get him. Because look, the Steelers' offensive line is coming together. So offense is coming together. D'Angelo Williams is still a good running back. And I, I've said this before. This is what baffles me about it. it, it you draft draft, you know, Niall Davis or, or you draft uh, running backs that are basically injury handcuffs. You're only going to use them if the starters out. So if I told you Jamal Charles will miss three games and you'll get three starting games out of Niall Davis, you'd move him up two or three rounds on your cheat sheet. You'd say, oh man, that means that's like almost a quarter of the season. I'm going to get starting numbers out of him. Even better, you get those three games with D'Angelo Williams at the beginning of the season. So you have your Le'Veon Bell handcuff, and if you didn't trap Le'Veon Bell, you're going to get those three extra games, or you maybe you can trade the Williams to the Bell owner before the season or after week one when they realize they are their ways. And um, he, he's a good running back and a good offense. I just ran this is a chance for me to plug one of my articles. Cease. I just did uh, 32, the th ranking the fantasy football offenses from 1 to 32, broke them down by categories, you know, quality running back, wide receiver, tight ends, offensive line, offensive coordinator, are the game scripts going to be offensive, uh, conducive to offense, and so on. Pittsburgh's right there with New England and Green Bay and Indy at this point. They have a terrible defense. They have an amazing set of wide receivers and running back and quarterback to go together and an offensive line that is the best they've had since, blah, I mean, who knows? Uh, so you want pieces of this offense. You know, if Le'Veon Bell were to go down, we'd be projecting D'Angelo Williams as what? Top 15 running back week to week? Yeah. yeah. I mean, a, a high running back. High end running back too, yeah. Yeah. So so how many other backup running backs can we say that about right now? 
uh, and you can get those those three games for free. So I think D'Angelo Williams is one of the more underrated players in fantasy football right now. I think that's where that fits into this. Um, and I still think Le'Veon Bell. Chase Stewart did a tremendous article about the best four game stretches in uh, fantasy football running back history. And I believe that uh, Le'Veon Bell weeks 13 to 16, kind of important, last year was seventh all time, all time running backs. Um, that's what you're getting if you're taking him. Who cares about the three games? Take D'Angelo Williams. You'll be fine. And by the way, DFS owners, I will have to imagine that D'Angelo Williams' salary is going to be pretty damn low, Bloom. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I think that they're going to release the prices like in July. So we'll have a chance to talk about that. You'll have a chance to talk about that on the new DFS podcast. Yeah, the new DFS podcast here on the Audible feed. You want to make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes. Thank, thanks, everyone, for doing that. Also, our DFS Crusher app coming out, our Draft Dominator app coming out again. These are all within a matter of a, a couple of weeks, Bloom. Correct me yes. if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. Football Guys Magazine, you know, constantly updating. It's the app. It's the magazine that you want right there on your tablet, on your phone, uh, you know, uh, Google Play Store, iTunes Store, etc., Make it happen. We've got our iBooks coming out, you know, how to crack the code for FanDuel, how to crack the code for DraftKings. Uh, so exciting, uh, as always, to be a part of Football Guys. And Bloom, as we tie a bow on tonight's show, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. You know, the, the struggles of anybody out there that, that's in the listening audience or family, friends, whatever. Let's just get out those positive vibes, baby. Be good to each other. And again, Bloom, it's a privilege to be part of our listeners' lives. It really is. We thank you all. It's, 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 I, I consider it a much greater accomplishment than any fantasy football accomplishment or any professional accomplishment with respect to fantasy football and prominence that uh, so many people uh, that I that I've, my life, I just feel so much richer. Uh, every day, emails, uh, tweets, notes on Facebook, and uh, it's it's really, really tremendous. And I, I, if we can even give a fraction of that back to y'all through our show and through our own personal interactions, then it's wonderful. And I, I think that as you brought up earlier in the show, just heavy times and we turn to each other during those times and we find our, our redemption in each other. Uh, and I think that uh, that is something that the show has embodied and hopefully will continue to embody because we're just following y'all's lead. He's Sigmund Bloom. Follow him on Twitter at Sigmund Bloom. The show is at the Audible. I'm at Cecil Lammy saying thanks for watching and listening. As always, stay tuned and stay frosty, baby.